yeah, I just, I mean, the whole app, the whole political system is set up to produce what we have right now, which is kind of like a vintage race where, you know, before the era of not only social media, but broadcast media, mass media, before the U.S. industrialized, you'd have two sort of doddering, um, only semi-mentally acute white guys occasionally waving out of a train window to a crowd and the whole election was kind of run with like posters being placed around cities and uh here we are with that same scenario except you know with clips of joe biden uh playing on loop on fox news i mean sean hannity he calls him he doesn't call him status quo joe like a lot of the bernie people do he calls him quid pro quo joe the Bernie campaign refused to bring up Ukraine and Burisma. I don't know if they thought it was fake or whatever, but he says, here's status quo Joe. And then they just play clips of him, uh, you know, unable to complete a sentence. You know, it's weekended Biden's. It's really kind of sad to watch. I haven't seen this much elder abuse since Robert Mueller testified. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the way that this is what the system is set up to produce. Um, so I'm not surprised. Surprised. I mean, I, I wanted to have some hope that Bernie could actually triumph, but I'm not surprised. The Democrats showed a lot more discipline in defeating Bernie than they have against any Republican in my lifetime. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's up to the people in Bernie's movement to do some reflecting right now. What do you do now? You do have kind of a, a movement. There was this really hopeful time uh, where people were gathering in large crowds and rallies and chanting, not me, us. And I was thinking about that today as I look at the streets just completely emptied out. What do they do when they can get back into the streets? And I think what you have to do is assert yourself as workers, not just as voters. Because the way these elections are set up, the way they're covered, the way our entire politics is structured, it's to keep you as a spectator, to keep you at home watching 24-7 coverage of impeachment hearings that you can't even understand. Like, who the fuck is Vindman? Who are these people? No they just come shit. out of nowhere. And then you're supposed to get up and everybody stand up and cheer for Vindman. And then Vindman goes away and has a comfortable life. I don't know what he's doing now. Um, but, you know, you're a spectator. That's over. I mean, it has just been completely revealed right now for, I think, a new generation, whatever you want to call them, Zoomers. But I saw it, you know, I kind of lost a lot of my faith in the system after first watching the Supreme Court select George W. Bush, basically shut down democracy. Then 9-11 takes and, place. And again, by the way, at that same time, the people who were being cheated publicly, openly, transparently cheated did not fight back. No, exactly. And it was Al Gore. I mean, they told Al Gore, look, you, you'll, you'll, you'll still be a public figure. You'll be beloved after uh, you lose and you agree to like lose an election you won. Don't send Jesse Jackson down here. Don't bring Rainbow Push down here. We don't want that part of the Democratic Party anyway. Um, don't bring him down to Florida. Then you can go grow a beard and move on. We'll sponsor some talks for you and you take up a pet issue and people will kind of see you as a hero and you'll be rich and you'll go away and you'll be happy. That's just don't do this. And Bush will just be a caretaker president. That's what they were saying in 2000. He's a compassionate conservative. He'll just serve one term and he's not going to do any harm. Then 9-11 happens. The returns of American empire uh, are visited upon downtown New York. And you have a, what, 99 to one vote for the Patriot Act. Uh, the uh, AUMF, which is still in effect, it has not been... Um, has not been sunsetted by Congress still. Um, it, you know, I'm giving emergency powers to declare war anywhere the president sees fit to wage a global drone war, the war in Iraq. It's a global um, jihad by corporate it's just, America. It's, it's, yes, and it's a well, it's a constant unmasking. And at I and and at, at this point, the the public and the specific sector of the public that would be most inclined to stand up and resist this, not the people who went out with the fake resistance, they're completely immobilized. They're physically immobilized because of the fear of just dying, of having someone just spew up some like toxic phlegm on you. I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm part of that. I'm I don't, part of that too. I'm not I leaving the house. So I'm what not leaving do the house. I, I've, got, I've got yellow vests. If there was ever a time to get into the streets, it would be right now. And, you know, people had said, well, what Bernie has to do is, is mobilize his movement. He's got to mobilize his people and tell them to get in the streets. And I have to tell them that is one thing Bernie will never tell them to do. 
No, you know, um, Bernie did vote against the war in Iraq after voting to um, set the stage for it with the uh, Iraqi Liberation Act, which made uh, regime change the official policy of the U.S. in 1998, put $90 million into the pocket of Ahmed Chalabi, um, this kind of con artist, and uh, set the stage. They were trying to set the stage for what happened in Syria. Jesse Helms, who is one of the authors of this bill from the Republican side, racist Jim Crow senator from North Carolina, he said, our model should now be the Afghan Mujahideen. And they basically wanted to have, uh, you know, so-called moderate rebels wreak havoc on Iraq. Instead, they wound up getting, you know, the invasion of Iraq. Right. And there were huge rallies across the country that I participated in. Um, I, I, rem I protested Bush's um, election also because it wasn't an election. I was out there with like 20 uh, hippies. Who, nobody else came out. But there were huge protests. They were planned by International Answer. And Bernie... All he had to do is walk a few blocks to this giant rally of half a million people on the National Mall, and he didn't show up. Who did show up was Jeremy Corbyn, who flew out with his own money across the Atlantic to join it. And I think that really says a lot about Bernie Sanders, who's surrounded himself with these kind of bogus progressive apparatchiks on foreign policy. There are some very good people in the Bernie campaign who I know, people who are, are just brilliant minds on foreign policy, but it seems like the faction that won out was the kind of sort of who, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know so people wait, in this. Wait a minute. Yeah. So you're telling me that inside Bernie's campaign, he has people who are brilliant on foreign policy, yet his foreign policy constantly repeats CIA talking points. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. I said, there are a few people who are brilliant, who I know. He's got fucking I Matt Duss. I, I could probably count him on. He's got that fucking on... guy, Matt Duss. He's right from the Center for American Progress. Well, that's He's what in I, his that's fucking what was, campaign. That's what I was going to build up to. So I was going to say the, the brilliant, the good people, oh. I could count I can count them on Django Reinhardt's left hand. Ah. But the progressive, this sort of people who come out of the Center for American Progress and that whole world who think we have to go on this global crusade against Jeez. authoritarianism, that's, you know, who Matt, what Matt does embodies. And, you know, you sh I remember a few years ago, um, I wrote a book called Goliath. Um, it's about, you know, compiling five years of my reporting on apartheid Israel. Um, I was spending a lot of time there documenting the situation as Netanyahu kind of consolidated right wing control over the country. And the book generated a big discussion um, it was a real, it, it brought a lot of energy to the Palestine solidarity movement. I was being attacked by, you know, liberal Zionists and Matt Duss comes out and attacks the book. He compares me to a, uh, a neoconservative, uh, by saying, you know, I'm just as extreme as the people on the right with this, you know, book that slams Israel as an apartheid state. And he actually defends Netanyahu in his review. And he was clearly doing that to kind of cultivate himself as a respectable person yes. in Washington who isn't too, he isn't going to really side with the Palestinians right, too right. strongly. He's got a, he, 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 he did the classic thing I've seen from so many progressive careerists. It's hippie punching. And, yes. you know, I've been, I've been punched by so many hippie punchers. Yes. I, it, I, I have CTE from like progressive activist careerists punching me, uh, in online. Of course, they don't punch in real life. If you like, and so because Bernie has such a horrible picker and he surrounds himself with fucking guys like Matt Duss. Uh, he is pathetic. You know, when Bernie was Russiagating himself, remember what, that? They said he's a Russian Trojan horse. Uh, there are secret intelligence assessments that the public can't see. So Matt Duss appeared at a uh, meeting of the Quincy Institute, which is this new think tank in town here in Washington that says it's dedicated to uh, ending endless war. There are some good people affiliated with it. He's speaking on stage just at an event. He's not connected to it. And I got up in the audience and I asked him, uh, Matt, you know, why is Bernie Russia gating himself? Like, why don't you actually push back? They're they're straight up saying that he is a Russian asset. <laughs> I know. And they're going to keep doing it. If you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And Matt meekly says, and almost this this voice, I could barely hear him. And he said, you know, we looked at the intelligence assessment and the, and, uh, the senator found it very convincing. So we're just going to go with that. So he found it convincing. He's convinced that he himself is a Russian asset. And this is his main foreign policy guy. That's the message he's sending. 
I mean, so so now what is now how does that happen, Max? Now, I don't you know, I don't know the inner workings of a political campaign. Maybe you do. How does someone like Bernie end up hiring someone like that and everyone else in the campaign doesn't go, what the fuck is wrong with you? Well, who else is in the campaign that has the power to do anything? Bernie, you know, as late as 2014, and I, I give him some some credit on this because he moved on the issue of Israel, Palestine. Um and he was more outspoken on it than Tulsi Gabbard, who, you know, she was kind of a mixed bag and she voted for a bill to sort of criminalize the BDS movement, to criminalize progressive activism. I think she should have been pushed back on harder about that. But Bernie, you know, in 2014 was shouting down his own constituents at a town hall over Palestinians being slaughtered in the Gaza Strip where in, a, in an, an Israeli assault that wound up killing 551 men and children, like wiping out entire families. He did move on the issue because of pressure, but this is not someone who came from a place of you know strong anti-imperialism. He was not Jeremy Corbyn. He wasn't fluent on the issues. And then he gets surrounded by think tank people. And then you know those think tank people get branded as like these heroes who are taking on the Beltway blob in the Nation magazine, and it's like nobody knows what to believe or why Bernie put on such a pathetic performance when Biden red baited him and attacked him. And it's just like, that's who he is. That's who he's always been. I really appreciated his candidacy. He uh, helped maybe uh, seed the public with the idea that a, you know, kind of social democracy was possible in the US, that socialism wasn't evil, but he is just not the person to lead a revolution. And I don't think he wants a revolution. So that was one of the questions I wanted to ask him if he ever came on the show was, you know, it's obvious you're intellectually, it's an intellectual on, dishonest statement to start your speeches with. Uh, you sound like you're ready for a revolution. And then when they say yes, you go now vote for Hillary Clinton. That is not what a revolutionary says or does. And how do you square that circle? And so that was just, and of course he wouldn't come on the show. So I never got to ask him. Another question was, I have a videotape of him saying uh, in 1995 that uh, we have to have a rainbow coalition happen in this country and it has to happen outside the Democratic Party. And so my next question to him was going to be now, what changed between then and now and who's wrong? Was that guy wrong then or are you wrong now? And of course, I never got to ask him any of these questions and no one else will ever ask him those questions uh, who interviews him. They won't ask him those questions on the mainstream media because they don't give a shit about that. And progressives won't ask him those questions because I don't know, I guess they feel it's impolite. I don't know. But he certainly never has asked, been asked those questions or had to answer them. Yeah, I mean, and let's 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 just pretend to be charitable to him um, about endorsing Hillary Clinton. He wanted to, you know, stay in the game so he could run again. But there's not going to be another Bernie Sanders campaign. I don't think. I would be really surprised. Um, I think he's 78 years old, um, and uh, at this, you know, coronavirus seems to have saved him from having to do multiple, multiple events trying to get young people to vote for Joe Biden. Um, and uh, that's what he was going to do. That is what he was going to do. Now, now Joe Biden has to do these really uh, tragic happy hours oh, with the youth God. population. It's it's sad, but Bernie was going to go out and endorse Biden and be even more uh, supportive of him because you know Biden isn't as, as 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 kind of like repellent and 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 vicious as Hillary Clinton is. I think Bernie really personally disliked Hillary, but he would have been fine. With his friend Joe Biden, how many times did we have to hear about his friendship with Joe Biden? It was going to be like one of those old, like Wilford Brimley buddy movies uh, with him and Biden. So that didn't happen. Um, I don't even know if Biden will actually wind up being the candidate. But I, I don't see how he. I don't see how Biden makes it. I don't know how he made it through that debate. Somehow they must. If Bernie had do that, I saw so many people just like uh, trashing Tulsi Gabbard for endorsing Biden, and you know justifiably so maybe, but they would never, these are, you know, Bernie influencers, but they know in the back of their minds that Bernie was going to go do the same thing and then some, and what are they going to say about that? And what would it do to his movement if he was constantly campaigning for Biden? I mean, we may not see it happen anyway. So he's, yeah, I mean, the coronavirus probably put an end to that. Yeah, definitely put an end to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know. I uh, I said that when when Tulsi endorsed Biden, I'm like, well, you know, 
that my, my theory was that Bernie didn't return her call or wouldn't even take it. And so she's like, well, I'll just move on to the nominee because you're going to fucking do this in a month or two anyway. So I'll just be you to it. And people saw that as me apologizing for Tulsi doing that. And that was my mistake to, you know, be so clumsy to speak like that. No, I that that's not that still doesn't make it OK. I'm saying that was another misstep by the Bernie campaign. He could have had that endorsement, but they didn't want it. Uh, there's a lot of people inside Bernie's campaign who saw Tulsi as toxic and wanted to keep them separated. And so they did. And um, so that was a misstep, I think. Uh, some people maybe don't think it is, but I do. I do. It's just another misstep. You know, you have to learn how to build coalitions, right? And if you can't build a coalition with an anti-war vegan who doesn't take corporate money and step down from the fight for you, I mean, then you don't know how to build coal. Am I wrong about that? Well, I mean, it, it ultimately would have wound up as a coalition with Joe Biden, um, right, 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 right. You're right. You're right. I know that's the whole. So that's why I'm done. I'm done with all of them now. I'm done with the anybody who props up this Democratic Party. I'm done with especially now over them all voting for this this bill that is going to just crush workers and their and their and their and their excuses. I didn't fight against it because I couldn't. And so I'm sure that was Bernie's campaign when he ran for Senate was, hey, what's one guy going to do anyway? Wasn't that his campaign slogan? What's one guy going to do? Is that his campaign slogan? Because that's what people are saying. What was Bernie support? What's one guy going to do? Is that his campaign slogan? Vote for me. What's one guy going to do? <laughs> it's what Obama always said when he was president. He'd be like, well, the Congress, look, let me be clear. The Congress made me do it. Had to do it. Except, except, Max, people forget that when the Democrats had a com complete control of the government, the House, the Senate, a filibuster-proof Senate, which they had for several months, uh, what did we get? We got a right wing health care plan anyway. We got we got uh, we got the the we got the Arctic opened up to drilling twice. We got five point one million people kicked out of their fucking homes at, while we made the banks whole and bigger. We got two wars to seven. We got the Bush tax cuts made permanent. That's the kind of shit Democrats get done when they have complete control of fucking government. Yeah, I remember uh, the, the 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 fateful vote for that the ACA, Obamacare, and they had to get Bart Stupak, who is this backbencher anti-abortion Democrat. He was like a hardline Catholic to vote for it. And in order to do that, they withdrew protections for women and withdrew funding for poor women to get abortions. Uh, it was really a day to cheer. And then I went out and tried to get my Obamacare and I realized that you know, it sucked and it was expensive and it kept getting more and more expensive and the healthcare industry kept getting richer and richer. So here we are. Now people realize uh, having uh, health care from your employers doesn't do much either because 30% of the population is about to have no employer. <laughs> that's, that's okay. And Joe Biden is still saying, uh, I'm going to veto Medicare for all. He's, we should just cut. Well, I'll cover the coronavirus illness, but nothing else. It's like it, and 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 they're gonna and and AOS everybody every progressive inside the Democratic Party is gonna say you have to vote for him. Not one of them is gonna say this is fucked up and we need to do something different. Well, you know, we're also seeing um, what we're seeing in in many ways is the effect of Donald Trump being so ferociously right wing and moving the Overton window to the point where all Democrats feel so traumatized by him and Russiagate was used to traumatize the public. All of these, um, you know, basically psyops were deployed to get people to abandon on the progressive left their own agency and support anything, any sentient being, even weekended Bidens against Donald Trump just to, uh, what, restore decency to the public. Because, you know, Biden is always restoring decency, decency. by sniffing girls' hair and and, and you know, finger banging his 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 aides against their will well uh you know there you go um there there's this this the, the trauma that people let seep into their psyche on the left compels them to do things like vote for this corporate giveaway slush fund for steve mnuchin it compels them to go out and allow it, it would we would have compelled bernie to endorse and go out and campaign for Joe Biden. It compelled Bernie to go out and support Hillary Clinton. And that's really the role that the Republican Party plays in American life is moving the Overton window, making sure that there can't be any resistance because of the fear 
of some psychotic, fascistic, authoritarian Republican getting into office. So we always have to come around and unite. Uh, and the and the corporate Democrats, they're they're the ones who always ask us to hold our nose and vote for whatever uh, you know Wall Street marionette that has Lloyd Blankfein's hand up their ass, controlling it like a puppet every year. But they'll never hold their nose for someone like Bernie Sanders. It's completely unacceptable for them. They always get what they want. So here we are. Um, we didn't even get into the horribleness that's happening right now uh, in, in with our foreign policy, Trump putting a, on more sanctions that are going to kill people in Iran. Uh, nobody stopped. He just put out a bounty on Maduro's head, which by yeah. the way is CIA talking points that Bernie repeats that Maduro's a horrible dictator and blah, blah, blah. Right. Does he not? He still says that, right? Yeah. He says, you know, Maduro, he's, he's a terrible guy and he's a dictator, but we shouldn't be, um, removing him or it just, it, it's so like, he moved, so what, what happens then Max, when he, when you say that now you've taken the argument and you've moved it all the way to, should we go in or not? Instead of what the fuck is the problem? So now you just, when you repeat the CIA talking point that Maduro's a bad guy and a dictator and all this stuff. Now you've, you're, you are um, validating the pretext for invasion. And if you're yeah. moral, now you have to do, if you agree with that pretext that he's a horrible guy and a dictator hurting his people, now there's something wrong with you if you don't want to go help those people. So he's defeating his own argument once again. He's rushigating himself on foreign policy all over the place. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, Ron Paul is someone who has really nothing in common with Nicolas Maduro. Nicolas Maduro is a socialist. Ron Paul is a libertarian who believes in Austrian economics. But Ron Paul would have said, why is it the job of the United States to enforce the Monroe Doctrine? Why is it our job to determine who's in charge in Venezuela? And you know, what I would have done is explained how Nicolas Maduro was in fact elected. I would have gotten into the details there. But Ron Paul's message would have resonated with a broad sector of the American public across party lines. Uh, and Bernie, you know, he still has a kind of imperialist, American exceptionalist mindset. Yes. So so what just happened, and, um, you know, there is, you know, at least for the first time because of coronavirus, we're actually seeing some mainstream Democrats signing on to a resolution to relieve sanctions on Venezuela and Iran. Um, partly because there are negotiations going on in Venezuela that the Trump administration wants to sabotage. The Trump administration just put out a literal mafia-style bounty on the head of Nicolas Maduro. Um, there was already a, an assassination attempt to kill him in 2018 using explosives attached to drones at a military parade. So the Trump administration, through this you know, high right-wing authoritarian, uh, you know, kind of form, actually a former... Uh, CIA employee himself, William Barr, the attorney general, um, they've legitimized the assassination of Maduro. Um, they've done a lot of really uh, bizarre things with this uh, mafia style bounty. They listed several figures affiliated with Nicolas Maduro and accused them of being part of a drug cartel called the Cartel of the Sons. It's a cartel that actually doesn't exist. Uh, we've heard of it doing nothing until now. But it's something that's constantly been invoked against Venezuela in order to uh, con convince the American public that Venezuela and not the U.S. protectorate, the U.S. bastion of Colombia, is the world's leading drugs exporter. The DEA's own maps show all of the drug shipping lines coming out of Colombia, which is under the control of a right-wing president who is a disciple of Alvaro Uribe, who was signing off on flight licenses in the 90s for Pablo Escobar and was himself on DEA lists of international drug traffickers. So these are the US's allies. And they're saying that Maduro is a drug trafficker in order to get him killed. Um, the craziest, I mean, I could talk about this for days, but basically what they're doing and what we've been talking about for the past hour is you know, the exploitation of coronavirus to achieve corporate and imperial aims. And what the Trump administration is doing is just trying to put its regime change policy on hyperdrive to use a disease and its lethal impact to weaken uh, opposition to the US, to pulverize the Iranian public, to pulverize the Syrian public until their leadership is somehow removed. It's financial terrorism. It is a definition of state terror. So we actually have a terrorist government 
that's tightening sanctions. And, you know, I do want to commend these Democrats who actually signed on to this resolution, but it is just that. It's a resolution, and we're hearing very little about these sanctions. I mean, this should be another reason uh, for people to be infuriated, to at least want to get out into the streets, because this is war. It's a silent and deadly war. According to the Center for Economic and Policy Research, between uh, 2015 and 2017, which were the early stages of sanctions on Venezuela, 40,000 people died excess deaths. Um, and it's that system, you know, that the U.S. seeks to export at the barrel of a gun that's always been here. Uh, many people in the U.S., the working class and the poor, are internally colonized subjects of empire, and they will bear the brunt of this stimulus package. Well, Max Blumenthal, uh, thank you for taking time and talking with us today. Uh, it's a depressing time. <laughs> I wish yeah. I, I wish I could be the hope and change political uh, progressive show, but uh, I just got to just just a, there's a lot of hard truths that I think the progressive movement has to understand right now if we're to move forward and actually do something, because we keep putting our faith in leaders and 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 in and political parties that uh, uh, is misguided. And no, I really, I really commend you. And, uh, you know, this is therapeutic for me. Uh, if I'm not coughing up blood in the future, um, I would love to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. I would, 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 would certainly always love to have you back and everybody check out. Let me see where, let me find your book so I can show them what it looks like. And, uh, here it is the management of savagery. And, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so thanks for coming on. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the tough talk to the progressives, Max. They have to hear it. <laughs> tough talk for tough times with Max Blumenthal from the Gray Zone. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. Okay, and congratulations on your wedding with your special lady. Thank you. It's made <laughs> self quarantine a lot better. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I bet you. All right. Well, congrats, and uh, we'll see you in about a year and a half when this is all over. Yeah. <laughs> See you on tour in a year and a half if uh, we're yeah. all alive. Yeah, we, we, we're going to come to D.C. We're going to do shows. We're going to see you. Nope, can't do it now. Yeah, well, I, you know, we've actually never met in person. So. Oh, that's right. I have never met you in person. I feel like I've met you. Yeah. yeah. I, how, how tall are you? Yeah, I'm only six feet, but I think I, I, think I look better in person. Oh, okay. I look, you know, on camera. I don't really have eyebrows, so I just look like... <laughs> It's weird, these two blue dots and this weird white kind of pale Six feet glow. is pretty tall to me. I'm sh I'm a short really? guy. I always thought you were... I used to be much taller. Tall I used to be much taller, but now I'm not. I shrunk. I shrunk. But anyway, Max Blumenthal, thank you very much. Congrats on the wedding and the marriage. You. Enjoy your quarantine, and thanks for the, thanks for the <laughs> tough talk. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay. Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium, but, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?